uh, I would like to first thank the organizers for this invitation. Also, I apologize that I have a very sore throat. Um, so today I'll be talking about displaced uh, signatures for new physics at Bell. By new physics, I mean mostly what I will concentrate on is axions or dark gauge bosons. And the mass range would be around MEV to GEV. This is a region which is interesting and the reason is twofold. Firstly, it is rather challenging theoretically to look into, let's say, axions of around a few tens of MEVs to hundreds of MEV, even to a GEV. And secondly, this is a re region where experiments did not have much sensitivity. And this is where Bell comes in. And Bell too, in fact, can do wonders in this particular uh, mass frame. And this talk is mostly based on these following two papers. So just to put things into perspective, new physics can be anywhere and different fron frontiers probe different parts of the new physics parameter space. And today I'll be mostly focusing on Bell, which is an example of intensity frontier physics. So by intensity frontier, I mean it uses intense source of being, very high luminosity, and looks for rare processes in the standard model. Because these processes are rare, if there is any new physics, it won't be masked by large standard model background. And therefore, this is intensity frontier is an excellent place for look for to look for new physics searches. And the type of beyond standard model questions that it can address, for example, as I said in the beginning, it could be an axion or a dark photon, matter, antimatter, asymmetry, strong CP, dark matter, these sorts of questions can be addressed in terms of these new particles. Also axions and dark photons can be a portal between the dark sector and the standard model sector. The mass range again, and I repeat, around a few tens of MeV to a few GeV. So before going into the details, let me briefly talk about the Bell detector and the difference between prompt and displaced searches, as you know. So prompt would be the particle decays at the interaction point and displaced it traverses a little distance and then it decays. Therefore, it's long lived. That would also mean the decay width is small. Therefore, for a fixed mass, displaced searches typically could probe lesser coupling. Of course, if it is more or less, then you would have invisible signatures, but you have to make sure that at this low coupling, you have enough production so that you get number of events that you want. Now, this is a schematic diagram of the Bell 2 detector. Given the theoretical motivation, there have been many probes for uh, uh, axions or dark photons and they rely on both visible and invisible channels. And as I said, visible channels can largely be categorized into prompt and displaced. Now the Bell 2 detector has a silicon pixel detector, a strip detector, and together they form a vertex detector. And it ranges from the beam line along the radial direction up to 14 centimeters, let's say. And we have a central drift chamber as well, which goes to 113 centimeters. Now, for displays, to look for displaced searches, one typically puts a cut on the radial distance, which is from 10 centimeters to 80 centimeters. The lower limit comes so that you can neglect all the prompt backgrounds, mostly from K long or lambda. And the upper limit is just because you assume the decay happening deep inside the, inside the CDC. Something like this would give rise to a displaced signature. Something like this would also give rise to a sig displaced signature, but as, as you can imagine, the more closer it decays to the CDC, the less effective it becomes to reconstruct the vertex. Therefore, there has to be an efficiency attached to such decays. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So of course, Bell has uh, a typical uh, track finding algorithm. But all of it can be roughly summarized in terms of this falling efficiency factor, where R max is again 80 centimeter, R min is 10 centimeter that reduces the, all the prompt backgrounds, and you have the falling efficiency to account for the less effective vertex reconstruction from the events 
which decayed very deep inside the CDC. But this is not all. There is also a probability attached to any particle which traverses a distance L and decays. And lambda is a characteristic length of that particle, which is essentially beta gamma C tau. So the total probability of identifying a displaced vertex attached to any particle which traverses a distance L and decays is a convolution of these two parameters, the probability and the falling efficiency. So therefore the efficiency would look like something like this, where again, our max and our uh, L, uh, max and L min can be evaluated in terms of R max and Z max and so on and so forth. So overall, by doing this, one could assign an efficiency for a displaced vertex search, which we need. Then there is a production times decay branching, which depends on the model that you choose. So this is where I'll talk about two case studies, axions and dark photons. And I'll first start with the axion. Now, this is an axion. Uh, is a QCD axion, an axion which only talks to GG dual. And the mass range, as I said, is few tens of MeV to one or two GeV. And I would repeat that the reason for looking for such action is twofold. Firstly, it ameliorates some of the typical problems which the standard action has, namely the quality problem. And secondly, this is a region where experiments were not sensitive before. And this is where Bell comes in. So it would be a little heavyish QCD action which only talks to GG dual. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, only talks to GG dual. This essentially solves the strong CP problem of the standard model, which is the standard model Lagrangian can be extended with the GG dual term. The term can be written as a total derivative, but unlike other cases, the total derivative can be reduced to a surface term and then put to zero, but this does not happen for QCD for, because of instant on like effects. So CP is violated at the non-perturbative level. And to solve this, you replace the theta term with a dynamical field action. And it turns out that the QCD induced potential naturally minimizes to zero, which is the CP conserving minima, therefore solving the strong CP problem. Now one would assume that the theta is order one, but if it's order one, then you have major consequences like neutron electric dipole moment. And from experiments, we know the bound would be less than 10 power minus 10. Whereas this axion has been looked for in, the, uh, in several experiments, several frontiers over the years. For example, this astro and beam dump experiment, they essentially look uh, for axions in meson decays or, or, or through mixing with pions and so on and so forth. For lighter mass, astrophysical bounds play an important role if the action is emitted from a stellar object. It takes out energy, results in cooling of the stars and so on. There is an aesthetic line, which is the Pechequin quality problem line. You remember the potential that I showed you is so shallow that any higher dimensional operator, even suppressed by Planck scale, can move the minima away from zero therefore jeopardizing the strong CP solution of the standard model. And therefore, if you assume it to be done by dimension five operators, this gives you a rough line over here. So in the beginning, I said, this is the range where we will focus. This is the range where Bell experiment comes in around a mass of few hundred MeV to GeV. And the channel we will look for is rare uh, BDK processes. Now, as you can imagine, if I start with a GG dual coupling and look for B2S transition, it turns out to be a two loop process. The action is emitted from the gluon because of the GG dual coupling. And you have the W loop, which changes the flavor from B2S. So I repeat, you start with action GG dual and the operator that you want to match at the weak scale is from BS and an action. So the whole point of the work is to start from this theory and to evaluate what my Wilson coefficient is at the MW scale. But we also need to know what else gets generated during this process. So I'll just briefly talk about the idea. Again, there are four types of, yeah.
The idea it will come later, but this is where I am sticking to a basis where it only talks to GG dual. I can rotate this away and the generate other two terms that you are talking about, or I I can have a general structure where I have GG dual. But it's not a generic point. It's not a generic point. You can yeah, and you can have a GG dual a derivative coupling with quarks and a mass term as well. But this is something like KSVZ would give you only a GG dual sort of thing. Yeah, so when you start with such an axion which talks to gluon and you are interested in B2S transition, there are four sorts of diagrams. One where you attach the gluon line over here, one over here, and one would be outside the two. And since it, these are two loops, you'll have one over epsilon square poles as well as one over epsilon poles. You have to identify all the subdivergences of the loops which can give you one over epsilon poles you have to squeeze them inside such as this. So here the AGG dual coupling, AGG loop, this loop has been squeezed. That gives you one over epsilon. This loop gives you one over epsilon. So resultant you have a one over epsilon square poles. So this is a counter term. So when you add all of this systematically, you can get, a, get rid of all the one over epsilon square poles. But you are still left with a one over epsilon pole and that uh, you can get rid of by assuming a off-diagonal B2S axion coupling. So the final story is even as Tuhin was saying, even if you start with AGG dual, there is no such theory as only AGG dual. You have to have axion quark couplings and axion off-diagonal quark couplings at the UV itself. These are not generated because of RGs. These you have to have at the UV so that it takes away all the divergences of the theory, it renormalizes the theory. So the next story is simple. You start with all the three operators. These have different Wilson coefficients. Now your theory above the UV scale would dictate what the sizes of the coefficients would be. You can have a flavor violating axion coupling at the UV and then we'll have drastic consequences as far as experiments are concerned. But for the time being, again, as, as I said, we start with AGG dual and assume the Wilson coefficients of these terms are small. Then you run it down. Z are the anomalous dimension matrices. You match it with the operator over here. And then you can further run it down where the experiments are running at the bottom mass scale. So this is just to show that out of these three coefficients, it's the B2S of diagonal coupling, which dominates. Even if you have assumed the UV Wilson parameter to be small, this is what drives the, the uh, amplitude. Uh, how much time do you have? So once the production part is done, the decay, uh, we took it from someone else, uh, this paper. And this is an example of Bell where again, E plus E minus the center of mass energy is around 10 GeV. It is at the uh, upsilon uh, on shell condition which upsilon decays to two Bs and then B goes to K and axion. And the branching ratios of the axions can be plotted over here. So we have the production cross section. We have the branchings. The efficiency depending on whether you have prompt or displaced would change as I mentioned earlier and then you can have some order one factors here and there. Now, as it turns out, again, if I start with only AGG dual and all the other operators are small, I can calculate the decay width, right? It will mostly go to hadronic states, no leptonic states. It will mostly go to hadronic state as shown over here. It turns out that within this small mass range where axion decays to three pions, the lifetime is such that display searches could be useful. Of course, if you assume you have other UV couplings of the axions, other decay modes uh, can give rise to display signatures. But assuming what we have assumed, it turns out that this is the range where action decays to three pions is sensitive to display searches. And as you can see, these are the lengths, 100 centimeter to 10 centimeter and so on. 
again i would repeat that if you assume other axion couplings you will you might have a large uh, larger exclusion this is from the axion to 3 pi and the green band is from axion to di photon there is one thing which is interesting that axion to di photons also could be prompt or displaced however the sensitivity of the calorimeter is not that great in bell to know whether these photons are coming from the interaction point or their displaced so you have to assume that this come from the interaction vertex you have to assume that these are prompt and then you have to have a smearing downward smearing effect where r is again uh, c tau beta gamma c tau and s is the distance from the interaction point to the face of the calorimeter the major backgrounds are of course k omega omega going to 3 pi but you can by putting the displaced signature around 10 to 80 centimeters you can get rid of most of this background k long gives you a reasonably large background k long although k long decaying to 3 pi has a very small branching ratio around 10 power minus 7 but uh, the, because of the decay length larger decay length you might have around 5 events at the end of the day k short can go to pi plus pi minus and a pi not then you have three pi signatures but again assuming that the mass peak would be around k short by neglecting that bin or by removing that bin you can essentially get rid of most of the backgrounds just to compare the prompt and the displaced the prompt is over here and the displaced is somewhere over here as you would assume because displaced searches are long lived, decay width is small, coupling is small, smaller for a fixed mass. Invisible searches would be even lower, but again, as I said in the beginning, you have to make sure that at those couplings, the production is not too small. So this is all about axions and what? Yeah. 15 centimeter, I think. C tau would be 15 centimeter. Right, yes. Okay, so whatever we have done for axions can be done for a dark photon or any dark gauge boson and the similar thing would follow. If indeed this is a dark photon, it talks to E plus E minus directly. We don't have to produce it from the B decays as we did for axions. And then essentially you follow the same rule and I'll show you the uh, exclusions for dark photons. Again, this is projected with Bell's uh, uh, projected luminosity of 50 atoburn inverse. And this is the present data with 200 femtoburn inverse of data. This is only with dark photons. You can play the same game with different Z primes with different couplings. For example, L e minus L mu, uh, G prime is G X, L e minus L tau and so on and so forth. This particular is, is of little interest. This is, this is what people use to explain the X17 anomaly, the protophobic uh, uh, gauge boson. And as you can see with the Bell's present data, you can rule out most of this region which people would have uh, used to explain the X17 anomaly. Uh, just a remark about the famous L mu minus L tau, but it doesn't talk to the electrons directly. So at the end of the day, we have to assume a kinetic mixing where you generate a coupling with the electrons, but you do the same thing and then you, you can probe large part of the parameter space. It also cuts some parts of where uh, G minus two uh, is probed. So I'll conclude maybe a little before time, which is displaced vertices give rise to unique signatures with almost no background. And the proposed searches, this one I believe Bell is working on at present, A to 3 pions, or also axion to die photons. Similar such strategies can be implemented for dark photons. It's a complementary test for the atom key anomaly of the X17 gauge boson. And similar studies, I mean, once you have a hammer, you pick nails, and similar studies can be done with blue X and other experiments. Uh, the production would be a little different, but roughly the efficiency and other things would work out. And hopefully they, they would uh, exclude separate parts of the parameter uh, place that you want to. 
So yeah, the, uh, this is what I had to say about uh, display searches. Thank you for your time. You. Okay, so we have some time for questions. I think already you're more. Hello. So if there is going to be a process like axion going to pi plus pi minus pi zero, which takes place at the scale of the detector, mm -hmm. then will there not be many such events lying around in the data from hadron colliders, LHCB, Atlas, CMS? Okay. So I'll go back to one of the uh, slots. It's not mine, but someone else. Let's see. Oh. Huh. So you see, uh, Hadron Colliders, even LEP or LHC, is sensitive to a little higher mass around 5 GV or 10 GV onwards for obvious reasons. Assuming this term is generated by some integrating out some vector like quarks, hmm, you can have this flat line, but then again, that is model dependent. It's essentially the triangle anomaly loop and the quarks which are running in the loop. And this is what uh, LHC would be sensitive to. All the rest, this is from low energy experiments like uh, pion experiments, k on dk experiments, neutrino beam dump experiments. So you, where you take out all the charged pion which are sources of neutrinos and take only neutral pions which mix with axions and give rise to some interesting signatures. All of them can be combined to this line. And this is more of an aesthetic line. And this is the standard QCD axion where the mass relation is followed. Here, since we are looking a region over here, therefore we necessarily have to break this relation. So by the way, by coming back to your question, yeah, collider is sensitive to somewhere here. Not for lower MeV or few hundred MeV, not for that much. Bell, of course, Bell is a collider. Bell. Can I just ask a more or less quick follow up of this? Hmm. Is that especially when there is a ZZ prime uh, kinetic mixing yes. at left, I mean, right. because we produce so many of Z, does that make any dent on this uh, plot at all? Or uh... So ZZ prime would be the dark photon case. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, uh, here the mass ranges are extremely small. I mean, I would assume if LEP is sensitive, it would be somewhere over here. Ibono, do you have any idea about LEP? Yeah, whatever, but LEP would be sensitive to uh, some somewhere. No, over I mean, the way he is saying it, he is perhaps going to reduce the yes, product contribution of the Z prime at LEP. Yes, yes. That's what he is trying to okay. do. Yeah, because I don't recall any uh, like sort of bound on this from. Uh, I, I see. Now, I, I would like to maybe talk to you later because. Yeah. It's sure, sure, sure. Not sure I understand it completely. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, that seems to be a because okay. of that, simply because of the large number of cells. Right. What is the typical lifetime? Uh, yes. So you, you can see the decay lens. It's around once. So this green line is where action goes to two photons. I see. And the lines are like 10 centimeters, 100 centimeters. So for lower masses of axions, do you expect, uh, because you are now considering this process, for all like star cooling bounds, etc., to go that's, away? That's much lower. Yeah, but uh, does the same process remain there, the same argument? Which argument? Uh, that you must have this coupling that uh, causes this. Or, sorry. Uh, because, so that how, whole how, argument over there, for example, if you take neutron star, axion has to talk with the nucleon. 
yes. when the axion gets out it takes away energy and that results in cooling of the star if the axion promptly decays inside it the photon because of multiple interactions might get captured and okay. you might not have any i mean it it doesn't really change the luminosity of course others might know more than me but essentially i think that is the argument yeah but those are in the kv yeah less less okay yes. got it thanks temperature of the star essentially this is probably a stupid question but uh, if it's a very light uh, axion uh, supposing i think of a high energy gamma ray coming from uh, somewhere say uh, agn or whatever and uh, it uh, interacts with the diffuse starlight can i produce an axion what are the rates for that and would that leave any signal a photon line a talks to two photons and are you replacing one of the photons with no a photon interacts with the uh, high energy gamma uh, gamma ray comes and hits a diffuse photon starlight and produces an axion would that leave a, any disable signal i mean certainly that process is possible but i don't know uh, the effects uh, and how how large fa or how small fa do you need to have any signals the numbers i don't know Okay. I can I can check. Thanks. Yeah. So when you have this uh, action in the final state in the meson decays. Meson. So yes, here. So B two K. Ah, B two K or say even for K star. So then act then this action has coupling with gluon. So I'm wondering how well well this uh, QCD factorization will work because ultimately it looks like a non leptonic decay, right? When one uh meson is missing maybe in the detector one meson is missing ah uh, i can thought like because this action has a has gluon coupling so and these are all hadrons in the final state b and also k or k star right. so then whether this uh, qcd factorization what we use like okay if we have some lep semi leptonic decay we have just a form factor for b2k and other part is leptonic so we can factorize so that actually won't work here in principle because we'll have non factorizable contributions and those can be like anything which can change the branching fraction to this any other value we are done using data driven approach this branching so are done using uh, meson decays into the final state and then changing that meson to axions using the mixing picture yes that is the axion to x but i am saying b to k a B two K. That prediction will change a lot, right? If action has gluon coupling, so we'll have kind of non-factorizable effects. Even with this FA, uh -huh. I don't know. Even with uh, one TV FA. Yes, maybe because non-factorizable contributions are really difficult to compute. So nobody can tell exactly how big those can be. I mean, you can compute the quark level process, right? That's no problem. B two S A. And yes. fold in with a form factor. You are saying that form factor would have, but the 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 corrections would be always a m a over f a or m a over f a squares, right? These are the two scales which are present. No other scales are present in the theory. So there, these are non-perturbative effects. So okay, maybe we can discuss later. And also, this uh, all these diagrams when you compute, uh, so you have all these lambda u v dependence, right? In the plots you are showing. Right. right so how much it depends if we change oh, okay so we took into account to we gave two examples uh let's say 1 tv and 10 tv 1 tv is roughly where lambda is equal to fa 10 tv is roughly where lambda is 4 pi fa and because of the large log uh, you get sizable difference for example here 1 tv could become 7 8 tv or so on. Okay. So log has a large effect. Thanks. After you have after you have done the RG, maybe you could go to a basis where A G G dual can be completely rotated away. So that coefficient goes away, and so the A appears only in the mass term and kinetic term. So that in that basis, using chiral perturbation theory, you could go up to a point and you could. derive the action yes chiral perturbation theory will be right but in this case it won't work here i am talking about bd case chiral perturbation so i am saying so 
Yes, so you don't and have chiral perturbation, and you. So in, yeah, in principle, we don't have any analogous method to compute. Okay, I think we should stop here, so we can discuss afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you again.